We have with us today an unusual person, rather a remarkable person. Mr. Fuller is described as an architect. He is that because of his intense concern with living space. But he is something more than an architect because his obsession is with the architecture of the universe. We all have heard of Mr. Fuller's invention, the geodesic dome. It is now seen all over the world. It is a brilliant use of space and material. Then the world map and other items. But what is far more important, Mr. Fuller has shown how to get the maximum from the minimum material by making the most intelligent use of the resources available on Earth. He has often spoken of how he was born with the handicap of far-sightedness. As a child, he could see the far-off things clearly. And as a young man, he lighted upon the idea that if Einstein is more right than Newton, then the mind ought to live in tune with the speed of light. In 1927, I decided man was operating on the most fundamental fallacy. He's operating on the basis that man was supposed to be a failure and therefore he had to prove his right to live. And each man then thought he had to say, I, I can show how I can earn my living. The other people are supposed to die. I decided that the fallacy was that man as designed was, was designed to be an extraordinary success. His, his, his characteristics were just magnificent. And what would be necessary would really be to find out what were the great comprehensive patterns operating in the universe, how then the metaphysical man as mine could become the master of the physical. So I then said, I think my first grand strategy of finding out how to use the world's resources so they will take care of everybody would come back then to how to take care of his living equipment. Uh, this brought me then to what I call the Dimaxian Tower House, the 4D Tower House. And it was a 10-deck building which is so light and so strong as finally engineered that it could be carried by the grass septum which was about to be built at that time and was perfectly flyable uh, economically to the North Pole where it could be anchored. I gave myself then the task of designing a building which would house a, an a airplane maintenance crew which we'd be able to install in remote places in the Arctic so that we'd have stepping stone flights to Europe. I, once I'd proven this feasibility of flying a whole building 10 decker to North Pole, I then turned to the idea of the single family. So I developed what I call the single family Dimaxian house. Looks like a house hung in a pole simply because there's a wire wheel construction, has less weight, so I turn the wire wheel over on its side. The hub is now a mass. For a family of five, it had great space in it, good sized bedrooms, each with a bath, a large living room, utility room, library, sun deck in the top, and hangar and garage down below. The whole thing came out then three times, that is. I found a house equivalent to the, that kind of facility with all the accessories in it. And the conventional way of building at that time ran over 150 tons, so that it, it was a very, very small fraction of the total weight. This then brought me to a whole series of additional experiences. Later on, 20 years later, in 1947, I developed in the Beach Aircraft Company in Wichita, Kansas, the first actual Dimaxian house. I built then with the aircraft industry's extraordinary structural capabilities. Made across uh, all of aircraft aluminum. The mass itself was stainless steel. It consisted of seven tubes bound together in the hexagonal collection. And each tube weighed on only 10 pounds. It was 22 feet high. Top of it, you'll see the great ventilator. It's 18 feet in diameter and rotated as does a wind tee on an airport. A low pressure area occurred at this point where we then had the ventilator tail open. We pull the airs of the house through the completely air conditioning. You're going to see the actual Dimaxian drilling machine coming out, but as a service industry, to handle as the telephone company does, installing what you want, where you want, just where the telephone company installs the telephone booths along the highway, and you'll be able to call up and say, 
I'd like to have my drilling machine over here and there, and the autonomous equipment will be coming out with the aerospace technology, and so I think we're just about to realize it. I'd gone into the building world after I'd been in, in the world of this very advanced technology and found it crude and the exactly other end of the scale of the competence when the, the, the science was putting into the weaponry world. And I was so shocked to find how simple man had a way of science, found no scientist ever looked at the plumbing. The Imaxian bathroom is solution of the place where we go in to bathe and, and wash and to take care of the human processes. I was able to do a whole bathroom, including what we call a manifold of plumbing, all reassembled, e everything, and a manifold of wiring, and a manifold of the air conditioning for only 450 pounds. In 1933, I turned the money which I'd been given into cash I had in my pocket, and I arrived in, 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 Detroit, in uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut, to produce this, this new uh, ground taxing quality of the omni medium transport. Because it just wasn't going to go on the ground, I knew people would call it an automobile. It wasn't designed just to be an, an automobile at all. Uh, she was so extraordinarily stable, and my center of gravity was very, very low, and for the first, first vehicle that ever had the center of gravity forward to the midpoint of the wheelbase. It did prove to be a very good vehicle, and did have very high efficiency. I had 11 passengers, I averaged over 22 miles per gallon. Sometimes I got as much as 30 with 11 passengers, and it's very, very high. The front steered car with the kingpins can already steer up to 34 degrees angle. My rear rudder post I could turn so I could give you 90 degrees rudder if I wanted. This meant then when I wanted to come in to park, there would be a space just, say, six inches longer than my Dimax in car. I'd simply bring my nose into the curb and then throw my rear wheel sideways and she went right and flopped like that. In uh, literature, there's something called generalization. It's trying to cover too much territory, too thinly to be persuasive. But in science, we have a generalization. A scientific generalization means discovering a principle which holds true in every case and never fails. We have a man going through the forest and, and he, a lot of trees have fallen. There have been great storms. and. It, and he finds he's walking on, along on top of a tree to try to get from here to there, and the tree begins to sink kind of slowly like this, and he says, what's going on? He retreats back here. And then he gets down here again, and slow, goes down slowly, and he sees a tree being, uh, on top of is walk, lying across to another tree, and the other end of the tree he's on is under a great big tree, and he tries to go over and lift it. He says, I can't lift a tree like that, but every time he comes over here, the big tree is lifting. So he says, I think I got a magic tree, and he, and he drags it home, and everybody worships it, but uh, pretty soon his wife says, I think any tree will do, and uh, that's really a, a generalization, and this is our principle of leverage. For instance, I got, I'll just take it. Here, here's a piece of a good stout wood, and, and, and we get down there to a, a stone, and I try this. Sure enough, I lift the big stone. Whatever the distance from the fulcrum to the load, is your basic income. You come out one, two, three. I'm now able to, my effort will lift three times my own weight. It doesn't have to be wood, it could be reinforced concrete. That's the typical generalized principle. Not so many of them, they're all inter accommodative and they work anywhere in the universe. Take a piece of rope. I want you to think about yourself now in the terms of a, a moving picture scenario. You have, you all seen moving pictures run backwards where people undive out of the swimming pool back on the board. I'm going to run a moving picture of you in a, in a backwards manner. <laughs> You've just had breakfast. Now I'm going to run the picture backwards and, and all the food comes out of your mouth and on the plate and then the, <laughs> and the plates go back up under the serving and then they go back in the things under the stove, things go back in the ice box, they go back into cans come out of the ice and in the cans, and, and they go back to the store, and, and then from the store go back wholesaling, and then they go back to factories where they're going to put together, and then things go back into trucks and then ships, and then they finally get back to pineapples in Hawaii, and then they go, the pineapples separate <coughs> out and go back into, into the air, they go, the raindrops go back into the sky, and, and so forth. And, and within a, 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 a very fast, accelerated re reversal of a month, uh, practically everything has come together that 
you now have on board of you, which is gradually becoming to be your hair and your skin and so forth, was, was uh, a couple of months ago, some hair coming over their mouth, their mountains and so forth. In other words, you got very completely deployed, and I want to begin to think about yourself in, in, a, in a, an interesting way. As each one of these, there were trajectories. If we'd had a tracer, some way of putting tracers on to make photographs, we would see these very remote chemical elements gradually getting close and close together, and finally <coughs> getting into these various vegetable places and, and into roasts and into tighter and tighter in cans, getting in the store, finally getting into just being me, and that be temporarily my hair, my ear, some part of my skin, and, and then, then, and then that breaks up and goes off and, and gets blowing around as dust. Otherwise, I'm coming to a concept of each one of us being a very complex set of slip knobs, sliding along on a very complex pattern integrity that you're born with. I took over 70 pounds recently, because I was overweight. I said, who was that? That wasn't me. I've taken on over 1,000 tons of food, air, and water since I was born, and, and I'm not to any of that poundage at all. When I die, I still would be somewhere around 140 pounds, and, and you can throw that away, because that's just yesterday's cereal. When men die, they've been weighed many times, no weight is lost. Whatever is you and I, is this metaphysical. I'm not trying to imitate nature, I'm trying to find the principles she's using. Now, get that seaweed has come to the most extraordinary structuring. Very, very strong in tension, and there are these beautiful little pneumatic bulbs to give, make it float just exactly at the right depth. In the, in the ocean, and to just exactly the right depth for her to prosper and do whatever it has to do. I get down to the details of this, looking at it like our friend's plastic and all those little mass, mass attractions, the curls that go on there. Na nature's formulations are just, to, to me, absolutely uh, unbelievably mag magnificent. And I asked if any of them in the audience as scientists any of them say they did not see the sun going down <laughs> and no hands were raised. They'd had 500 years to organize themselves in relation to their fundamental information and had done nothing about it. Having taught our children about arithmetic and having given them a chance to draw pictures, we then say we will show you how you can co coordinate the, that picture with arithmetic and, and to be able to make some calculations, some we call them geometry. Geometry, the word that uh, measuring our Earth <laughs> means. And we start our children off by saying, we're going to give you a plane. We start off immediately then with that planar concept of our, our universe going laterally to infinity. We say to the child, here is a line, and the line goes to infinity, and the plane goes to infinity. This is very perplexing to a child, because a child has the same attitude as any scientist who likes to deal in experimental information. He finds, in talking about infinity, as the teacher seems to, they're talking about something that's not as yet been experienced. I'm really convinced that our troubles spring from our continually feeling so sort of comfortable, and that's the way I learned it. <laughs> That was good enough for me, and we did get along, and we did have a lot of fun, and, and, and so forth. So let's let it go that way. It's too much trouble to rewrite the books. We bought all those libraries. We, we taught all our teachers to teach it that way. So you just keep on teaching error. And the plain geometrical figure is described, for instance, as a triangle. A triangle is an area bound by a closed line of three edges and three angles. The circle is an area bound by a closed line of equal radius from a point. The square is an area bound by four equal length sides and four equal angles. All of the geometrical figures are areas bound by closed line, which is then teaching our children that 
that which is reliable and, and computable is always on one side of the line only. On the other side of the line, we don't have any definition. Why? Because it goes to infinity, therefore it cannot be defined. Because of our starting with plane geometry and the, the nonsense of infinity, we have given them a basic bias. We start our children off then, only our family is safe. We're on, on the understandable side of the line. Our town, our country is always that way, this bias. Now, when we do deal in what we call systems, and systems are conceptual and they subdivide total universe into without an outsideness and an insideness and a little bit of, of the universe which is the system itself. And the systems return upon themselves in a plurality of directions, whether they're spheres or cubes or crocodiles. And it is a quality then of systems that they have unit surface. Now, when we draw a closed line on a closed surface, as for instance the Earth, we automatically divide the total surface into two areas. As for instance, we draw a circle around our Earth at the at a, go, at a plane going through the center that makes what we call the equator and divides the Earth into southern hemisphere and a northern hemisphere. If you go outside here out to the ground and draw a little circle on the Earth, you automatically divide the surface of our Earth into two areas. You said, I did not mean to make, to make that great big one. <laughs> and because you were thinking of things going to infinity, it becomes very shocking to realize you've drawn the big one. <laughs> you look at any painting, any drawing, just research your memory, you find everything breaks down in, into lines, areas, and crossings. Those lines of Euler's take some time to be generated. And how long they take to be generated is measured by some kind of cycle. You look at your watch, you look at so many seconds. There's so many cycles, so many heartbeats. So you go in this direction on this line for so many heartbeats or so many seconds, and then you change your direction. So you have to say, what is the angle of change? In order to talk, start talking angle at all, you have to have some line of reference. So you take, say, the line of reference between your head and your feet. So there's that line, and you observe in relation to your, the angle, the, this line of yourself. You go at such and such an angle from, off from the vertical, and you go in so many seconds. Then you say, I now change and go in another angle, which is also describable in relation to the original line. So that we find all phenomena in the universe can be described mathematically by angle and frequency change. The frequency being then how many cycles there are that you went along any one line. Now that we then know that time is measured by cycles and lines are so many cycles long, we begin to think about patterns in, in a very mutable kind of a way. As for instance, I got here a necklace. It's a necklace because I can drape it over my shoulders. It's drapable. And the reason it's drapable is that the angles are all varying. The lines, which are such and such a length, because they say, let's say one of these lines here is so many frequencies long, so many heartbeats you get from here to there. Each one of those lines is staying the same. The lines are not changing, so what is changing here is the angles. I'm going to take out one of the necklace songs. Let that go out. So she's still nice and flexible, isn't she? Still draped over me. Now I'm going to take out one more of those and still is all flexible and drapes around on my shoulders. I'm going to take out one more. Turning my side on me. I'd like to take out one more. And it still is flexible. You and I tend to call what we have left here at the present time a square. But it really isn't a square, because it, it distorts in diamond, it can, and it can drape over my it's a necklace that can hang over my shoulders like that, completely flexible that way. It can fold up into this being, looks like one. I'm going to take out one more bead out of that necklace. And suddenly, a very extraordinary thing happens. No longer is it flexible. For the first and only time, I can put it on my head here, but it just doesn't flex or drape at all. The angles won't change. This is what we call a triangle. Now, the triangle 
if I was to take out one more, there wouldn't be any, any area at all. So I have a limit condition where I've gone down to where it suddenly stops flexing, which means that the angles don't change anymore. We knew the lines weren't changing at all. So it was all an angle. So triangle turns out to be the, what we'll call structure. It does consist of, of six parts. There, there are this edge, three edges, and three corners. And the corners themselves are something holding it together. So that we find that, let's take one pair of these sides. They're like levers. And if you have a pair of scissors or pliers, you know, the further you come out here, the more work you can do. You have more leverage advantage. So we come to the very ends of these levers, and then we put another push-pull member in here, and it stabilizes the opposite angle. So a triangle is a, is a pattern where each side stabilizes the opposite angle with minimum effort. What we call then a structure in our universe is a complex of energy events which are inter-self-stabilizing. And the triangle is the only inter-self-stabilizing set of a complex of, of, of events. So triangle is structure. And the, the, the triangle having three parts, you have the word three, a trace, or the word trust that you're familiar with. That's the, really from the Latin then, of the threeness of the triangle. So this has been known to man for a very long time. So when I want to build something and make it really work, I've got to use all triangles. And I, for instance, just look at our friend, the cube. And most people think of buildings, cubicle buildings being stable. But here, here's that cubicle building, and it hasn't any structural stability whatsoever. The angles are all unstable. In as much as we see cubes standing up, uh, structures in men, we really want to understand it, how it is, and we know that they, they are not structural systems themselves, but the tetrahedron is the basic structural system. I'm going to show you the simplest way in which we get the strongest cubical structure, which is simply put two tetrahedra together in that manner. So there's your cube now, the eight corners. Then there are two other structural systems in the universe besides the tetrahedron. The tetrahedron itself, we have three triangles around each corner. We can have the octahedron with four triangles around each corner. And we can have the icosahedron with five triangles around each corner. You can't have six triangles around each corner because they'd add up to 360 degrees and that would go on to infinity. So in order to be able to return upon itself, have insiders and outsiders, the limits are tetrahedron octahedron, icosahedron. Now, every structural system in the universe, in fact, every event, we have something called, we have an action, and when you, when you take action, when you, you step forward, you push the earth backwards, the, and you see this automobile starting up and kicking the, 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 the stones backwardly. Now, not only does every action have a reaction, but it also has a result, and it starts pushing the air apart. So every event in the universe has three parts, action, reaction, and resultant. And we make these lines of uh, representing regular, uh, all of our experiences, we call them vectors. They are energy events, and the energy event is depends on how much energy that, that is being expended, what its mass is, and what direction it's going, and what velocity. All of which we have it was spelled out, remember, an angle of frequency. So this is one energy event, action, reaction, resultant. Now, the physicist then is able to use this kind of a way of thinking of the vectors as a basic energy event, and he has two most fundamental kind of energy events, because he has the proton and the neutron, that either one would be called a nucleon, and we find the proton and the neutron always and only coexisting. And the proton has its energy side effects. The, energy, the proton has its electron and its antineutrino, and the neutron has its neutrino and its positron. And each one of those is called, in biophysics, one-half quantum, one-half of Planck's constant, one-half spin, any one of those three. Now, I'm going to put one-half quantum together with another half quantum. And we find, I must always put it together in an absolutely consistent way. I take, we call that male goes to female here. So this male going to the female. And here again, I've got a male which must go to a female. This leaves me then another male here which must go to a female. So here's a female, and that, make that fast, and we now have one male left, and that we have find one female left. We put it together, and then suddenly we come to our 
and the tetrahedron, which is the basic structural system in the universe. And because each one of those is a half quantum, the two together make one unit of quantum. So we now see a very important conceptuality beginning to characterize physics and, and all structural understanding. Now I take the icosahedron itself, and I'm going to be able to take, remember then that a, a basic unit of quantum has six edges or six vectors. So a basic energy event has six vectors. We'll call that then one unit of quantum will always be six edges. We find that the octahedron has 12 edges or two units of quantum. The icosahedron has 30 edges and 30 divided by six means that five units of quantum. And the tetrahedron by itself has then six edges or the one unit of quantum. I guess if I use the volume of the tetrahedron as unity, the octahedron has four volumes and the icosahedron has almost uh, pretty, pretty close to uh, 24 volumes. So that we've, for one unit of quantum, which is six edges, to get one unit volume here. Here I get, however, two units of quantum giving me four units of volume. And here I'm getting uh, 20 units of volume for five uh, uh, units of quantum invested. So that we get the most volume with the least quantum in the icosahedron. So uh, that becomes then a very basic structural system. I use it for geodesic domes, and nature uses it for all of the protein shells of all of the viruses. Remembering then our six units of vector uh, edge give us one unit of quantum. I'm going to take one unit of quantum out of the icosahedron, which has the 30 edges of five, five units of quantum in. I'm going to take one and just leave it four, four of them in. So what I have to do is to go around taking out one bow like that. Then I'm going to have to take out another bow over here. And I come around and take out another bow over here. I go into the other hemisphere, opposite that triangle. I've taken out three so far, and I want to to leave this this way, so I now take one out here. I take this one out here. That's five. Need one more to be removed, and here it is. So here we now have what's called a vector equilibrium with eight triangles and six squares. And I'm going to articulate it. I'm going to take this top triangle and it must be lowered towards the triangle on the table. And the ta t t triangle on the table mustn't twist, and the tr triangle up here mustn't. Just simply lower towards it. So as I start to do that, here we suddenly become the icosahedron stage. And I keep on, keep lowering. The point still stays out towards you, and lower, lower. Suddenly it becomes the octahedron. So we see a complete transformation from the vector equilibrium through the icosahedron down to the octahedronal condition. Now supposing and we see all the vectors have been doubled up, all the edges have been doubled up, so this is very powerful. Now, supposing this were a force, I, if I pull on it here, this forces it to contract, torque, and plunge through in this manner to become the tetrahedron. So now we've gone through a great, complete trans set of transformation from vector equilibrium through icosahedron, through octahedron, down to the tetrahedron, or the three basic structural systems in the universe. And now we see all of the vectors are fourfold. This way we go, for instance, from carbon, which is very relatively lightweight and soft, down to very hard diamond by getting into a doubling up of the vectors of the edges. Now we'll unwind again. Up we come, back again to our friend the vector equilibrium. And we find that this pumps. Sometimes it's called a jitterbug. Pumping, 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 but the center is not twisting. This point I mean, always stays towards you. So we have the whole system is contracting symmetrically. All 12 points approach a common center at a symmetrical rate. We have a very extraordinary matter in engineering here. Supposing then you would have a pressure on the roof of your building. You're used to the idea of the building flattening. But the pressure on the top of the building here means that the whole building contracts symmetrically. The, the vector equilibrium contains the whole phenomenology of a structure of universe. 
Now, this trial, trial with us these here, if we put one at the center, it's called vector equilibrium because it consists of four hexagons. You see a hexagon plane here at the center, another hexagon plane here, another hexagonal plane here, and a, and, a, and a fourth one here. And each one of those had six radii. So the six radii, are, are, are the 12 radii to these 12 points, are equal in value to the chords. Because you think, look at a hexagon, has six edges and six radii. They're equal value. So the tendency to explode and the tendency to contract are exactly balanced. That's called, why it's called the vector equilibrium. And they represent the closest packing of spheres around one sphere. A threaded sphere here, and then 12 spheres around it. So this represents the basis of all atomic packings and so forth, and all the oscillations and wave phenomena that are articulated in our electromagnetic world. Vector equilibrium is never witnessed by man. It is as pure as God. It is truth that is approached. It is exactitude that is approached. The nearest thing to the total patterning of all the patterns of complexity in the universe that we can find to the universe itself is man. You know what you could do, Dale? I can see. You keep reaching, and I'm, and I'm seeing you kind of keep reaching Antarctic and going off. And this is pretty good. I call it the inventory of world resources, human trends, and needs. It is my headquarters. So now I can see all the world at once with without any visible distortion of the relative shape or relative size of any of the uh, data. Now, this is very convenient because also I've been able to do it in such a way what you call the sinuses, where it breaks open. Uh, all in the water, so there's no breaks in the continental contours which we have in all of our world maps. So now you can see the whole world at once without any visible distortion, without any breaks in the continental contours, which means I have one world island and one world ocean. This gives me a basic background against which we're going to study resources, pollutions, and so forth. We really want to know percentages. And if you put it on, on a background that's very distorted, such as the Mercator map, it's very you don't get the right information. But because there's no distortion, if I put and find out where the demographic center for all the human beings are, and I put on uh, a thousand pins representing each one would be one tenth of one percent of humanity, where he actually exists. I put him on this background, and this really is accurate. So any percentums that I put on here are really can be read as percentums. If, if map was very distorted, you wouldn't get that sensation. So this makes it possible to really study world problems and we get to the pollutions and resources and so forth. This is fundamental. Each pin here is one twelfth of one percent of humanity. I want you to, to get a little feeling by looking at it of the really sp how sparse the population in, in America is. It's about the, almost the same kind of a, a density in South America, but then look, look at this fantastic, how Europe, concentration of people in England, concentration in Western Europe there, Italy not so bad, she's sending down as she gets in Russia. Then, then there's vast distances, incidentally, between where Russia exists and where, where India and China now, but when you get to this area, here's half of all humanity. Boom, just look, look, look at it. In China, the first movable type appears. You find the first balloons. You find the quaternary alloys of uh, 2000 BC in, in, in China. Industrialization really starts there. The differentiation of tension compression, the beautiful sails and masts, and then, then that went, went westward around the world improving metal workers in India, getting even better in, in, uh, in uh, Europe with their armor making and so forth. Then they got in the beginning of real industrialization. Uh, here, here, all the great scientists were all right in here. What is going on here is not only the uh, accommodation of my own world around activities, which are becoming large, and I literally do live around the world, uh, but also uh, I have a, this unique function of open, opening up new frontiers it could be that the world game which I've been developing here may become the whole curriculum of the university itself. My subject is that uh, 
based on the very big picture. The very big picture is of all humanity now going through a, a transition so, so uh, unprecedented, so unexpected as to be really very difficult to comprehend. And it's not just like going through the looking glass where you get a reverse pattern of yesterday. I can tell you that there are approximately, at all times now, 66 million babies in the wombs of their mothers. So 66 million is a very large number. See, it would be a, in the size of the nations, it would be a tenth largest nation in the world. I think all of humanity is coming out of a sort of a group womb, womb of uh, permitted ignorance of man, permitted ignorance, which is not a statement that uh, derogatory to man, but simply because it is the nature of the total process of regenerating life on Earth that the new life as born is born absolutely helpless and, and completely uninformed, though it has beautiful equipment, and being absolutely uninformed it is very ignorant. That's what the word means. And even when I, when I was young, Humanity was 90% illiterate, and we've gone suddenly to almost complete 90% literacy. So that anywhere I go around the world, people have good vocabularies, and that good, those good vocabularies got proliferated by the radio, getting into the homes and not through schools, and the television even more so, where they could correlate the words and the vision to see the objects. So that we have communication capability all of a sudden. But gradually discovering we do have this thing like the ability to acquire information and finding there are very reliable behaviors out of the physical universe which can be employed. Democracy certainly couldn't work so long as you really uh, have, it, uh, have an illiterate group who don't really know what's going on and are leaving it to a power structure which has all the intelligence information and makes decisions without people really knowing why. So I say we're coming to this absolute new, new, mo new moment when it could be that we, a phenomenon of democracy really might work. There are logical things that can be and should be done for all of humanity, which a democracy might really see very spontaneously, and that's what you just do. Now, with the information proliferation that is going on around the world, this could become a possibility. And I think that's, that is the moment we are really coming into. You're going to find, have to find out what needs to be done. How do you organize yourself to accommodate going from 1% of humanity to 99% of humanity who are now going to have to live and, and double or triple their lifespan, really give them a chance to enjoy the earth. And, and that, is, that, is, that is the design responsibility. So when you talk, hear everybody out here talking about ecology and so forth, it's because your architects were not doing anything. If you could sit, tip, tip, well, you sit around and draw some pictures out of field, if I get pretty, that's enough. You don't ever have to worry about beauty or pretty because if you're really understand your problem, if you solve it correctly, so life really goes on. This is regeneration of life, and you do it the most economically, so economically it is realizable. It always comes out beautiful. That's why a rose is beautiful. It is just one of those parts of the great regenerative process where there is an a priori design of the universe that had the universe working. If you want to be a part of that, you can't miss beauty. That part, of your, your joy will be there. Your joy will be just as much as it is with, with, with a beautiful sunset. The uh, number of people are now talking about roofs over cities is very, very large. It's now getting to be accepted uh, logic in, in uh, the bigger planning and so forth. It's get, getting, into, it's getting into, the, into the lingo. And it's the Garden of Eden. It's very small compared to talking about cities, but it, it certainly uh, opens up the thoughts about such larger undertakings. Every time you double the size of a dome, your energy conservation goes up very rapidly. We get something the size of a city, and the energy conservation will be such that the enormous kinds of problems they're having today about heat, heat uh, control and uh, the air conditioning and enormous energy power would be reduced to almost, almost negligible. And the dome of the city, city size, you just would not be aware of the grid at all. It would just be not quite as bright. In this expo dome, we have a three-quarter sphere, so the walls start going away from you, and there's a very extraordinary psychological effect of this uh, releasing you. 
inside suddenly realized that the walls really are not there. There is something that's keeping the rain away from you. It's like an umbrella above you. You don't feel shut in. Now that we know the principles by which we can cope with nature's most hostile actions of earthquakes, hurricanes, great Arctic snow loads, and now that we know how to get the best mathematics to get the most volume with the least, next thing is how do we produce the surfaces that will do this with, in the highest speed in the most economical, effective manner. There's no way in which man can produce material to enclose more rapidly than uh, in the great paper-making machine, great rolls. And then paper-making machine, you can also have the printing press, you can print very important mathematical information on it so that uh, we can make it perfectly possible then, and we now try it out, making what we call paperboard domes, where you print this beautiful mathematics on it, and the thing, you print the folding lines, and the thing folds itself. Therefore, we can now produce on just one paper-making machine 3,000 houses a day. And these houses then coming out printed, compact and beautifully distributable in the most economical manner. Paperboard domes come out about five cents a square foot, as against running around two dollars a square foot for our usual kind of enclosure. They are being made of today of the right craft papers that have very high wet tensile strength, very high wet, uh, wet compressive strength, and, and they, they can last as, as long as, as any uh, homes we've ever been familiar with, wooden homes. If you, if you would then have the dwelling that had the individual, individual package, that, that has a, a, in fact, a black, black box that, that did everything you needed, and this is exactly what the, the, the astronauts are, are going to have in order to make man, make man uh, a success anywhere in the universe in, within a very small capsule. You're going to have to have, take care of all these processes which on, on Earth are taken care of in, by an enormous ecological balance of, of, the, of, of nature. And that black box then uh, has to be very small in order to be able to, to put it in, into, into space. So that we figure about 500 pounds is the limit and it will be uh, not much bigger than a good size suitcase. At 500 pounds, uh, costing then originally $20 billion, will, however, be made out of metals that are very familiar metals mostly, very lightweight, of course. And they are, on an aircraft basis, are worth around $2 a pound. So you're only going to have a $1,000 box. <laughs> and that $1,000 box just figured on a, an annual rental, because uh, it, 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 it will not deteriorate very rapidly, so you soon might amortize it in five, five years, so if we call that $200 a year to buy it and uh, that would be your rental. So you get your black box for $200, and you go off in a, a geodesic dome, uh, some beautiful space umbrella, someplace, and uh, anywhere you want, and, and someplace where there's no high, high pressure uh, of living, and you pick a beautiful spot just as we are here in this island. And they, you can have the most advanced standard of living just out of your little black box. So that who's, going, who's going to pay those high rents of, of what you have today do entirely to the concentration and the lack of the little black box. You have, in effect, man within his umbrella and his briefcase able to go anywhere in the universe and live the very high standard of living. On the false working assumption that there's nowhere nearly enough to go around and never will be, that has to be you or me, man has then said, you must earn the right to live. You're supposed to die. You must show you're better than the other man. On this basis, then, society has been assuming that it's a handout or a socialist system if you're not earning a living and some job somebody has set out for you. So we have the idea is a, of a job is something you have to do that you don't like to do very much in contrast to what your mind tells you needs to be done or you'd like to do. So that the idea then, this is the earning living idea. And we said we don't want you to feel like pick and shovel kind of a job. We do that by the bulldozer. We don't even want you to be blue jeans. That's kind of gets your hands dirty. We want everybody to be white collar. So in order to have everybody white collar invent the job, we've had to invent an num enormous number of buildings. Every one of our cities is filled with great buildings uh, to accommodate these people working. Now, we also have the real estate are saying it's very unhealthy for the man butcher to sleep with the meat.
So everyone on stage is filled with fantastic great buildings today in which nobody's allowed to sleep. Therefore, at night, we have all the typewriters sleeping with all the beautiful plumbing and all the people sleeping with slums out in the plumbing. So what we're going to do is to simply make some sense now and say, I don't want you to be taking a job where it's not what you really like to do. I want you to know, go back to where you were a kid. What were you thinking about when they told you how to earn a job, earn a living? I'm not going to give everybody a fellowship to think. Out of every thousand you give such a fellowship to, one to make a breakthrough will pay for everybody. So we're going to afford it easily. So we're going to say that. The minute you do that, all the, those people are going to leave all those buildings. They won't come back because they don't need that money for a fake job. And we're going to move all the people out of the, plum, out, out of the slums right into those beautiful buildings. So the urban problem is actually completely solved today. People say to me, I wonder what it would be like to be on a spaceship. And I say to you, you don't really realize what you're doing. <laughs> because everybody is an astronaut. You all live aboard a beautiful little spaceship called Earth. What is now as clear as the speed of light itself is our realization that we've come to enough knowledge about how to do so much with so little understand enough about our great universe and man in the universe to realize his function is that of the mind, the ability to bring great order. And we have the beautiful realization that Einstein's great conceptioning can go from weaponry to livingry, and it is now practical. The metaphysical really master the physical. This is what man tends to call utopia. It's a fairly small word but inadequate to describe the extraordinary new freedom of man in a new relationship to the universe, the alternative which is oblivion.